I'd like to invite everyone to please stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be reading from Mark 8, verses 31 through the end of the chapter. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever would lose his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. This is God's word. You may be seated. Those are very challenging words from Jesus. Um, <clears throat> before we uh, look at it together, I want to just uh, lift our hearts up in prayer. I also want to pray for uh, Dr. Hopper and Sharon White. They'll be leaving this afternoon uh, for the Congo for a medical mission, and just uh, pray that God would keep them safe as they travel. So let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we're thankful for this day and thankful for being able to celebrate the sacrament of baptism with the Peterson family. We're thankful for all of these amazing gifts you've given us, uh, the gift of your word, the gift of your promises. And now, Lord Jesus, I pray as we approach your word, help us to live uh, in sync with it, uh, to live in this life under the covenant of grace in such a way that we may have life eternal. And so, Lord, we want to lift up as well <clears throat> David and Sharon as they uh, take with them the gospel of peace to the Congo. We pray that you keep them safe as it is fairly unsettled. But yet, Lord, we know that uh, through your grace and mercy, uh, you've called them to do this task and that you will provide for them to do so. And that we pray uh, two things, Lord, that your word will go forth in power we also pray, Lord, that uh, David, as he gets to uh, encounter his roots, where his grandparents were missionaries and uh, where his mom was born, we pray that you will give him the joy of being able to reconnect with that family history and the goodness that you've brought to his family throughout all these generations. And we pray that that would be so for us, Lord Jesus, as we approach your word. <clears throat> that we may not see your word just impacting us, but impacting the generations beyond us. For we pray this, Jesus, in your glorious name. Amen. So I want to remind you kind of where we are in the Gospel of Mark. We're like in the middle, <clears throat> eight out of 16 chapters. And not only that, but this is a place, a pivotal place in the Gospel of Mark. So what happens up to this point is everybody's trying to figure out who Jesus is, and we reach this pinnacle, and suddenly Peter blurts it out like he tends to do throughout all the Gospels, well, you're the Christ, you're the Son of God. He does that through the Holy Spirit. It's a genuine revelation to everybody there, and immediately Jesus begins to explain what kind of Messiah he is. Because that is definitely a fact that is not established. Everybody has a different idea of who Messiah should be and what he should do. And so Jesus immediately begins to teach them that throughout Scripture, God has, has made it plain that Messiah would come, be rejected, and suffer, and die, and be raised again. And so that's uh, fairly important to our day and age. 
uh, because in our, in our country, in our culture, we're not big on suffering and dying. In our culture, we like to think we can have it all. We like to think that um, you can do all the right things and be in all the right places and, and be able to gather it all together. I was just reading an article in Psychology Today uh, from a couple of years ago. It was entitled, Why Having It All is a Lie, How Sacrifice Has Become a Dirty Word. And the writer, Nancy Collier, describes a couple of people, and uh, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> she describes Jane, who's a mom and a physician, who wants a successful career as a doctor, but also wants to be a loving and present mom. And she was tortured by the fact that she couldn't be both of those to the degree that she wanted. She also, Nancy also described a college student who had a deep envy of the self-confidence many of his fellow students experienced through very focused commitment to sports or studies, while he liked to socialize and party. And he was actually angry at his therapist that she couldn't design a plan for him which would include partying and still provide that same self-assurance, which comes from hard work, time, and effort. Now, obviously, psychology is far from a Christian magazine, but it lays out the problem really well that we all face, is that we want to have it all. But there's something even more sinister. We actually believe that we can have it all by our own effort. We always joked in our family, uh, as our kids were in college, that uh, the three things that make up college life, uh, good social life, good grades, or good sleep, you can't have all three of those, okay? If you work really hard, you might get two of the three. But you, you've got you've to make a sacrifice somewhere. For, but yet, for some reason, all college students everywhere believe somehow that's possible, to have all three of those. Well, you might not be surprised that Jesus in Mark chapter 8 actually has an opposite uh, message for us, which is actually the solution to our problem, the problem of wanting to have it all and the problem of thinking that we can have it all. Uh, <clears throat> instead of pursuing what we want, Jesus encourages us to stop pursuing what we want and pursue what God wants. And what God wants actually is fairly shocking if you remember the words of Jesus here, he tells us that the way to gain everything is actually to lose it, to give it away. And it all comes down to how we view Jesus, how we view him as the Messiah, and what he came to do. So let's take a look. <clears throat> let's look at verse 31 again. It says, and he began to teach them. Now remember, this is immediately after Peter declares him to be the Messiah. And you can imagine the disciples' minds go, Psh, as they think, this is it, this really is the guy. And they suddenly have a million different reactions to that. And it says, Jesus immediately began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And it says in verse 32, the first part, he said this plainly. In other words, he was like not joking around. He wasn't creating big flowery metaphors, you know, for everybody to enter into. He was actually telling them super plainly, like, hey, guys, I'm going to die, okay? Just that's what Messiah is supposed to do. I'm going to die. So <clears throat> this is right out of the gate, right out of Peter's revelations, uh, Peter's revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. And this is the first time that the Gospel of Mark has said explicitly that Jesus will suffer and die. There's no warning. There's no foreshadowing this. This is a clear confrontation. It, it, you can feel it in the Gospel of Mark. You can feel the whole Gospel of Mark. Just take a turn as you read it. The disciples were not ready to understand Jesus point as Messiah, what his purpose as Messiah to be was, until this point. 
They needed the movement along and the, the gradual revelation of Jesus and who he was. They needed that over this time until this point, and now they're ready to hear the true message of Messiah, which tells us something about the nature of revelation, that revelation is progressive. I mean, you think about it when you're teaching your little kids the alphabet. You know, you, first of all, you try to get them to say all of the letters and say them in the right order. And then you start to teach them the sounds of the letters. And then you start to put those letters together in small words and you teach them those small words. And then you begin to move up to bigger and bigger words and you teach them the meanings. Okay, so it's progressive. You have to move through various parts. And the same thing is about Revelation. It's the reason why God doesn't lay out his entire plan in the book of Genesis. Because Revelation is progressive. The history of humankind is not ready for the full message. It has to be laid out over the years and in various ways. And in the Christian life, it's the same thing. Revelation is progressive for us. In the first part of the Christian life, we learn that Jesus can save us from our sins he can uh, protect us from our evil hearts. He helps us to understand uh, our sin and how he engages that. But then he begins to lead us to a deeper and deeper truth. You can see this laid out perfectly in George Herbert's poem called Affliction, where he says, I start off thinking, wow, the Christian life is great, it's wonderful, but then a deeper truth comes along, which is, that the, this is brought to us by a suffering Messiah who suffered deeply in our place. And the way that we enter into that is that we too will suffer. We too will experience the pain of life. And through that pain and suffering that we experience, we will understand Jesus much deeper and much greater. But we're not always ready for that message at the beginning. So notice, Mark tells them that Jesus began to teach them that the Messiah must suffer. And here's where we see our first point in your outline there. Who is Messiah according to Scripture? So where does Jesus go to help them understand who Messiah is and that the Messiah must, su must suffer? Well, he goes to Scripture, of course. Now the disciples have an opposite view, they have a conclusion that Messiah is going to boom, the kingdom's going to come, rule the world, all of our pain and struggle will cease, and everything will be great and honky-dory. Where did they get that? Well, they got that from Scripture, too. Who was right? Jesus, of course. <clears throat> so let me just lay that out for you really quickly. Even in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the inaugural prophecy of the Messiah, where um, God says to the serpent, he goes, the woman will have an offspring and that offspring will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. So as that prophecy has come down through scripture, we understand that clearly that this is the battle between Jesus and Satan. And that the battle between Jesus and Satan not only is going to crush Satan forever, but it's also going to cruelly hurt Jesus himself. In Psalm 22, we find a prediction of the suffering and death of the Messiah, as it's laid out for us there in a messianic psalm. In Psalm 118, verse 22, we see clearly taught by Scripture that the Messiah is going to be rejected. <clears throat> it says, the stone the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone that the pathway to Jesus becoming the king and the chief cornerstone is through rejection and suffering. Isaiah 50, Isaiah 53, both predict the rejection and suffering of God's servant Messiah. And if you remember in Luke 24, remember Jesus uh, has resurrected from the dead. He's walking alongside two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it says he explained to them through the scriptures that, Jesus, that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again. My guess is Jesus went to these scriptures plus a ton more to help them understand that it was clearly taught in scripture that Messiah would suffer and die. It makes me wonder why we think we are in, uh, entitled to a life that is pain-free. 
Why do we think that somehow, some way, you can eat, take the right vitamins, eat the right food, live the right life, and never suffer? Why do we think that? Where does that come from? Why, especially in America, do we believe that people are entitled to a pain-free, struggle-free life? Why do we believe that we, that we can somehow restore the Garden of Eden to humankind? And yet it's through the path of suffering that we're awakened to our broken, rebellious, anti-God world. You see, the, pro- the progress of Revelation through the Bible is a simple story. It's God saving his people, his people failing to keep God's commandments, chaos and suffering ravaging human lives, and God redeeming his people again. Now, <clears throat> you and I may be on a different place in that pathway. And probably if we were to all take stock of where we are on that pathway, we're in a different place. Some of us are at the bottom. We're in the place sitting in the ravages of our destruction of our sinful behavior. It might be relational sins. It might be addictive sins. It might be financial sins. It might be sins of laziness. I'm not sure where that is. I'm not sure where you sit in the house of sadness. But I want you to know that even if you're in that place, you can have hope. That God will meet you in the house of sadness. That he will invite you to confess your sins to him, whether they're relational, whether they're addictive, whether they're financial, whatever they are. And you can know for a fact that when Jesus suffered and died as the Messiah, that he suffered and died for your sins, for your brokenness, for your pain. And that he has covered you and covered your sins. And that God will care for you and love you on the pathway to rebuilding. Well, maybe you're in the middle. Maybe you're in the process of rebuilding your life. And you're discouraged because it's hard, because it's painful, because it's difficult. And you're tempted to give up and quit. And I would encourage you, if you're in that place, to confess to God your weak heart, to confess your lack of hope and your lack of trust, that you desire to quit, that you are in the midst of your struggle and you just don't know if you can do it anymore. Well, I want you to know that Jesus didn't give up in his struggle, that he carried it all the way through for you so that you could have hope so that you could have trust that he will carry you through this. That he went through suffering and death so that you know that he would give you strength to continue and joy in the journey. Well, maybe you're, on, you're one of those people that have experienced the American dream. Maybe you have it all. Um, maybe you're where you're not in a place where... You need to rebuild your life. Everything's going fine. But ask yourself some questions, because I, I think this is helpful. Randy Neighbors of General Assembly kind of asked these questions, and I think they're helpful for us to think. If you think you've got it all together, if you think everything's going fine, then maybe you should say, well, what else should I do? You should ask yourself, do I live like Paul and do I ca- have I brought every thought in captive to Christ? Am I really there? Or if you're, if you're happy with you know, how everything's going with your kids, um, do you pray for your children like Job in case they might possibly curse God in their heart every day? Do you love your neighbor like the good Samaritan, the person that hates you the most or that you are most uh, discomfortable with? Do you care for them as Jesus cares for you? Well, it sounds to me like we all need to repent of being self-satisfied. You know, that truthfully what's happened is that we just moved apart from Christ and we, we don't even understand the process of struggle and sin and death anymore. And ask Jesus to propel us back into the real world, into the world around us with a renewed vision of what God can do in us and through us. 
Which leads me to the next point. Well, what kind of Messiah do we really want? You know, who is the Messiah from the Jewish expectation? So notice the last half of verse 32. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus is talking about a suffering Messiah, and Peter's going, no, 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 what are you talking about, Jesus? That is not the, Bi- the, the, the Messiah of the Bible. What are you talking about? The Messiah of the Bible is going to come, and he's going to conquer, and he's going to bring beautiful life for all of us. What are you doing? You're ruining our prosperity gospel here. And so you can see why Mark included the story of the blind man's healing just before this. Because Peter's blind. I mean, he sees, he sees that this is the Messiah, he sees that this is God's Messiah, and that God's Messiah has all of this power and all this authority and all of this ability, but he still needs to be corrected because he only sees Messiah in this blurry, tree-like way. Peter needs another healing. Peter needs to see that God, in all of his power, in all of his glory, in all of his authority, decided to suffer and die for humankind. And Peter did not want to embrace that pathway. Peter represents really all of Jewish expectation. Or, you know, in a, some way, he, he represents a religious expectation that we all have. That somehow, if we embrace Jesus... That somehow if we ask Jesus to care for us, that all of our life will be pain-free and struggle-free and sin-free. Rather than Jesus helping us enter into the struggle and the fight and the suffering. The Jewish expectation was, was the Savior would come, save them from their oppressor, the one who was outside of them, rather than save them from the ravager who's inside of them. They thought Jesus would come and make them great again without the hard work and suffering and struggle of repentance of their own sinful behavior. They believed the problem was outside of them, and they failed again and again and again to see that the problem was inside of them. They wanted a king to free them, feed them, heal them, wipe their noses, clean up their messes, fix their problems, but not touch their heart. And that's not the Messiah Jesus is. And so he immediately begins to teach them that Messiah will redeem the world through suffering and lead them through the path of suffering to the eternal kingdom. So let me explain it this way. I'll use kind of an analogy. Many of you will remember around Easter, I had some sort of nerve thing happen in my right leg. I I couldn't even walk. Couldn't walk for about three weeks. And... um, so at the, you know, as things began to settle down a little bit, I had a choice, right? I could sit on my couch and watch my TV and not do anything. But that still hurt. The nerve pain didn't go away. But it, it kind of felt better than actually having to rehab it because that really hurt. You know, you get the nerve working again, you know, uh, The doctors call it flossing the nerve, making it go through the little nerve sheath and kind of get uh, activating the muscles again and all that kind of stuff. That was painful. I did not like that. But as I reflected on both of those options, sit and do nothing and rehab, I realized something about it, that sitting and doing nothing hurts really, really bad. As a matter of fact, it actually hurts worse than rehabbing. Even though rehabbing hurts, as I keep doing it, little by little, the pain is always there. But it's better to live with that kind of pain when you're rehabbing than to live with the kind of pain where you're just sitting and doing nothing. And I think that's a good analogy of what Jesus, the kind of life that Jesus is leading us to here. Now, I don't like pain. I'm sure you can relate to that. None of us like pain. There is no easy pathway through pain and suffering. It hurts either way. But the life of taking up your cross and denying yourself and following Jesus, even though it hurts, I can guarantee you it will hurt less than the other alternative. Which brings us to our final point. What is our response to the suffering Messiah? Look at verse 33. 
But turning to his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus plainly says, You're not setting your mind on the things of God. Or to put it another way, the suffering of Messiah is God's plan, and to resist God's plan is to follow Satan. You see, it's actually a trick. It's an illusion of Satan. It goes all the way back to the garden. But he is trying to convince you that there is an easier way than taking up the cross. There is no easy way through sin and death. It's painful either way, but ultimately, the alternative away from Jesus is more painful. Now, I want you to notice something that's kind of interesting here. So, Peter, I mean, the t- disciples have been talking, right? They all kind of agree that Jesus shouldn't go this direction. And so, they appoint Peter, take Jesus aside, tell him, you know, what he really ought to do. So Peter takes Jesus over into this little private corner and starts to yell at him and tell him, don't, don't, don't believe this. Don't believe this unprosperity gospel that you're trying to preach here, bud. We want life to be good. And so Jesus immediately takes Peter and says, buddy, come follow me. And he takes him back in front of the disciples and he rebukes Peter. He said, look, what you're asking me to do is to follow Satan, and I'm not going to do it. Because God has told me to follow the path of suffering. But then, notice that it says, Jesus turns to the crowd, and he begins to teach them. And calling the crowd, verse 34 and 35, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's We'll save it. So Jesus is explaining to us that working through the process of sin, of suffering and death comes through giving our life away and taking up our cross rather than focusing about how to shed our cross and save our own life. And so Jesus states two eternal truths here that are key for us. The first one is that the way to life is to deny ourselves. And he doesn't mean to put away the chocolate brownies so you're not tempted by them anymore. He means for us to cease living as the center of our own lives. We are not the center of our own universe. Instead, we are to live now as God is the center of our universe and to live to serve not to be served by the people around us. And then secondly, he he gives us the eternal truth that the way to eternal life is to take up one's cross. All right, so the truth enables that previous truth to take place, that if we take up our cross, if we die to ourselves, if we embrace the life of suffering and death, the best way to live is to be prepared to die which is what Jesus explains in verse 35. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, just states it as plainly as ever. He says, when Jesus bids a man follow him, he bids him to come and die. The best way to live in this life and to prepare for the next life is to die to yourself. Now, one of the main ways we Americans dodge this truth is that we try every way we can to avoid pain and suffering. We have built an entire economy around avoiding pain and suffering. We have have provided an entire entertainment system in order to avoid pain and suffering. We've got lots of ways to entertain ourselves, over-medicate ourselves, avoid poverty, and avoid the impoverished, to put the sick and the struggling in their own little corners where we don't have to see them anymore. We will do anything in our lives to avoid the view of suffering and pain. 
And so all of us are trapped by it in some way or another. I mean, we look out on social media, we look out on, you know, the news feeds, and all it does is put people in front of us, you know, so that we idolize them. So we think that, you know, professional athletes, because they make so much money, somehow avoid pain and suffering. We think that uh, movie actresses and actresses, because they make so much money and have these ideal lifestyles, that somehow they have avoid pain and suffering. So just the next time, go, go read one of the tabloids about how pitiful their lives are. I mean, there's some good that comes out of a tabloid, not much. Think about the social influencers. I mean, we, wa we all want to be a social influencer. We want to be able to sit in our house and portray it like we have this idealistic lifestyle and make money off of that. You know, so pardon me for saying this. I know some of you love Dave Ramsey, but I just find it really ironic that Dave Ramsey tells us how to have the perfect financial life, and he's making money off of us telling him you know, so that he can have the perfect financial life. Sorry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but Jesus is offering us an entirely different solution to our problem. He says to embrace the struggle and the suffering, enter into the problems, die to ourselves, and live for him. It's, his solution is simple and, and it's demanding. He first asks us the question. He says, is it worth it? Tell me, is it worth it? If you got your dream lifestyle, carry it all the way to the end. If you could be Bill Gates, if you could be um, any of the people that you think about, if you, any of the influencers, if you could have their money, if you could have their lifestyle, would you take that for 20 years to live in eternity in hell for the rest of your eternity? Would you do it? Is it worth it? Is it worth for you to gain in life and lose your soul? Secondly, he makes a statement Verse 38, he makes it personal to himself. He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, and he is saying to his disciples, if you are ashamed of me, that I am going to suffer and die and experience all the hatred and, and craziness of the world, if you're ashamed of that, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes to glory with his Father and the holy angels. In other words, if we reject Jesus, if we reject his path of a life of service, of giving up, of accepting pain and suffering, then Jesus will say, on that first day of eternity, when we see him, I don't know who you are. I don't recognize you. Whew, those are sobering words. Those are very, very stiff words. But I want you to notice that there's a promise here. The promise is, okay, but you don't have to reject that life. You can actually embrace it. You can embrace Jesus, the suffering Messiah. You can embrace that he suffered and died for you. And when you then take that first step across to eternity and you hear those words on the first day, they will be, welcome. Welcome. I love you. Welcome into the eternal kingdom. You see, there's good news here. You don't have to have everything. As a matter of fact, we've already seen that you can't have everything. Psychology Today, a secular publication, says to you, you cannot have everything. But this passage says, you don't have to have everything. You can actually have nothing. And you can have the one thing that matters. Jesus, and you will have everything. It's also a good news to those of us who have lots of gifts, lots of things that God's given us. It's an invitation not to use those gifts to dull the pain of life, to hide away the suffering of the people around us or even our own suffering. 
but actually to embrace life and all of its suffering, knowing that we can live in this life in such a way as to have life eternal in the life to come. And even more, embracing suffering in this life actually makes suffering more tolerable. Once you've acknowledged that life is painful and full of suffering, and you realize that this is the way it's going to go, and you realize that Jesus is going to walk with you every step of the way, suddenly the pain is not as great. And there's a ton of joy in it. Because we understand Jesus, the suffering Messiah, oh, so much more. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for these sobering words and uh, this great lesson from the Gospel of Mark to us. And I pray, Jesus, um, it's not new news to us. But Lord, it's easy for us to hear the voice of the stranger. It's easy for us to to forget the voice of the Good Shepherd inviting us to take up our cross and deny ourselves and to hear the voice of the stranger that whispers, you can have it all. You can have it all. So Lord, help us not to listen to the voice of the stranger, but to listen to your voice, to hear your word, to know your comfort, to find your strength. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.